And there's no sound louder than a captive set free So let the redeemed of the Lord say so Sing of His promises ever Being here tonight, I hope you're able to be here for most of the weekend um, You know, skip your church tomorrow, come here, it's fine Everything's good Pastor will understand uh, Just don't tell him I said that um, unless you are the pastor, then I'm busted. It's just the way it works. <laughs> so when you walked in the building today, you should have gotten one of these. If you did not get one of these, please pop your hand up. We'll put one in your, uh, in your hand. This is for the evening. Everyone got one? Uh, nope. Uh, you went right down here. Um, yep, got one right down uh, here on this side. Blue shirt. <laughs> yep. Keep your hand up, and Pat will bring one right to you. Yep. Excellent. So it's one per couple, please. Um, all right, so um, welcome. My name is George Gray. I'm the pastor here at River of Life Fellowship. Uh, so thank you very much. If you're not familiar with our building, if you've never been in here before, a couple quick things for you to know where they are. They're kind of important. Uh, the, the restrooms are through the door right there on the left side of the, uh, of the back. Just keep going straight. You'll run right into them. Um, if you need to use the nursing mother's room or the nursery, they're in the first hallway. Just immediately turn to your right. You'll see the doors. There's TVs in there so that you can still watch the service. But um, if you're in there, so if you take your child to the nursery, if you bring, brought your child with you, it's not throw them in the door, shut it, and hope everything's okay. It's like you need to be in there with your child. It's really, really important that that happens. Um, uh, and any children left at the end of the night will be sold. So um, it all works out. <laughs> Got to pay for the building somehow. It's the way it works. So <laughs> at a family and a marriage and family conference, yes, they're selling children. Um, so... Uh, I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to let uh, Dave and Ruth Ann uh, uh, introduce themselves to you. I know most people here are very familiar with them. They've been up in the area for a long time. Uh, so you've heard enough from me. Dave and Ruth, please come on up. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, George. Yes. Okay, well, good evening to all of you. So good to see you here tonight. This is a little different than tent meetings. I usually don't sit on a chair at tent meetings, uh, but we do enjoy this. We count it a great honor and a blessing and a privilege to uh, share this together, um, give you a little bit of um, background as to, of course, we've for many years uh, done some teaching on marriage and some premarital uh, counseling and all of that, uh, but just in more recent, you know, we, we've been married, uh, well, let's see, in May we celebrated 31 years. Sorry, I had to think about that a little bit. Uh, but 31 years of marriage and five children, one grandchild, but we're still learning. You know, we're in our 50s and we're still learning new things. Uh, in our marriage, and uh, as recent as about two years ago. In fact, we kind of have this t uh, tradition right now uh, at home, at our home church, uh, every, every, we, every year for the last, oh, probably five or six years, even longer, um, the weekend right after Labor Day, there is a big youth conference at our home church, and our children are very involved with that youth conference. And so if we're not involved, uh, I know years back I would speak sometimes and we'd be involved, but in the last number of years, they keep getting new speakers in, which I'm very okay with that. And uh, so our house and our bus is full of youth. So we are better off planning something for that weekend. And so when this came up, when the request came and we were looking at dates, I contacted Pastor George and was like, hey, how about the weekend after Labor Day? You think that would be a possibility? And um, so we, uh, yeah, it, but it's, it's a great time. We did get to meet some of them uh, before we left on Thursday. Uh, but it's a, it's a blessing. We get to tune in to their services. Everything's live streamed. And so we've been listening to it in worship this morning on the way up here. And I'm sitting there crying, trying to drive. And then she's driving and I'm sitting there in, in worship. And just, yeah, it just, it's, it's a blessing. So uh, we are grateful. And uh, so thank you so much for uh, coming here tonight, we're looking forward to the weekend, counted a great privilege uh, and an honor to, uh, to be here with you all. But two years ago at this weekend, my wife and I had 
the privilege of attending a mar- what we call a marriage intensive under Focus on the Family. And we learned things about marriage that those three days, what were we, three, three days, two and a half days or something, that we had the privilege, just her and I sitting with, with uh, a, a, not a couple, but uh, not a married couple, but it was a, it was a, a man and a, and a woman, uh, as therapists they call them. And we had the privilege of for two and a half days um, just sitting there and letting them teach us and speak into our life. And I know uh, I keep going through life, and sometimes I forget to slow down and smell the roses, if you will, and my wife helps me with that. She says, you know what, sometimes, you know, when you're just giving and giving and giving, and I know all of us do that, uh, sometimes you need people just to speak into your life. Those two and a half days were some of the richest days uh, of that year that we had the privilege of having. In fact, it, it so encouraged us, challenged us, motivated us that out of that, we put a curriculum together, and which we've started teaching now at conferences like this, or marriage, or uh, in fact, I've also, it's, it's basically life, but we're focused on marriage here. Uh, actually, uh, over the last couple of months, had the privilege of speaking to youth, and I've actually re- revised the curriculum and some of the same concepts sharing with youth. Uh, where that kind of came out of is um, uh, somewhere in a, in a marriage thing we were doing, uh, somebody came up and said, why, why, why don't you teach this to youth before they get married? Because they'd have such a head start. And I was like, great idea. Why didn't I think of that, right? Uh, but anyway, we are, again, so honored uh, to be here. And just in case you are not familiar, this is not that important. Uh, our family, well, let me go here. Uh, the first session tonight is the power of one. And what we mean by the power of one not so much that husband and wife are in oneness together. Now, that is important. We're not nullifying that idea. But the power of one looking into our own yard. You're going to hear that quite a bit, uh, especially tonight and tomorrow night, uh, about us looking into our own yard as an individual and not looking at our spouse for how we feel. Intentionally uh, connecting. And this is our family. Uh, Many of you have met them. And, of course, thank you for uh, praying for our grandson, who is now one year old, and he's running around. In fact, we just moments ago, before we came up here, his dad had sent a little video of him outside uh, helping, trying to help wash the car at one year old. You can kind of read between the lines how that goes. But this was his first uh, birthday cake, and... Um, if you would have seen the end result of that, it was all over him, and I don't know if you do that in New York or not, but when they turn one, uh, they just let them dig in. Things you teach them not to do, you let them do that day. And, uh, but we are we're very, very grateful. Uh, we celebrated our grandson's first birthday and our oldest son's 30th birthday, and they're two days apart uh, in, in their birthdays. And so again, by the grace of God, we are who we are by the grace of God. Intentionally connecting the power of one. What is my responsibility and what is not? Now here, I'm a, oh, how did that get in there? You didn't know that was. like it's a surprise. I should have checked. We checked this today. Yeah. It wasn't we, in there today. It wasn't in there today. Isn't this in? Do you have her on? Maybe you shouldn't have her on. <laughs> check, check. Yeah, just there you go. But no, in fact, we were at the hotel. We were going through our PowerPoint together, and, and she goes, why do you have two slides the same back-to-back? And I said, I'm going to put something in the, in the middle. And she just didn't know. But this is uh, when you go on vacation with your wife for two days. Now, we didn't fly up here, but um, we, uh, yeah, I don't know if that helps anything or not. But we'll just start with that. Uh, do you have any comments on that at all? Or you wanna just, want me to just keep going? Just well equipped when I go somewhere and you never left wanting. Oh, well, well equipped. Is is her mic on? Could you hear her? You just need to hold it. Oh, okay. There that you go. Be. There you go. All right. Well, no, we'll get. I confess, th- I don't pack light. I like to have everything in case. Yeah, she we don't run into trouble much. We have everything we need. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. But anyway, the power of one intentionally connecting, and what we mean by that is simply this. Our desire is, let me uh, open this here, but our desire is at the end of tonight 
that one of our goals, actually there's, there's three points that we want us to learn as we go through tonight. First of all, what is my responsibility and what is not? As a husband, as a wife. Secondly, why we often react in conflict instead of responding. Want to learn why that is. And one of the reasons that I often react or we often react instead of responding is we have unhealed negative emotions. We all have them. And so we want to learn to identify those negative emotions because it will help us, I believe, to learn how to bring them to the light and allow Jesus to minister healing to those negative emotions. And that will be our goal here uh, tonight. What is my responsibility and what is not? The power of one. Simply stated and directly, I am responsible for my own physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. So again, picture yourself as husband and wife. And as you, you'll hear from us as we share out of our own journey uh, we are far from perfect, but we love each other and we love marriage. And we, we're on a journey in even learning uh, what negative emotions are and, and what happens if they're not healed and, 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 and why we react. But again, I'm responsible for my own physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. And then to continue on with that, um, in our marriage relationship, share this with us if you would, hon. Yes, spouses often give this responsibility away, resulting in codependency, disempowerment, and frustration. We want our spouse to be responsible for what we think, believe, feel, and how we behave. In most cases, we are not even aware how we give our power away. Yet, when we realize how easily this is done, we can see evidence of abdicating personal responsibility. Expound on that just a little bit, if you would. You have an illustration. Sadly, we always have fresh ones. We don't even have to bring old ones along. <laughs> you can say we, that again. We uh, produced a new scenario the day we left home. Do you want to talk about that afternoon? Sure, go ahead. We're just, we're just an open book. So I was affecting you. I, I triggered you. I was not ready in time. He had come home and said, I want to leave around 2. And I kind of threw out hints like, it's going to be a challenge for me, but I'll try. Because we had company there. We were switching out bed, bedding and whatever. But um, instead of me calling him and telling him, no, let's go at 3. I think it would actually be a good time to ask. I like to interrupt her when I can. It would be a, a, a good time to ask. Uh, couples, it, you know, can, can anybody identify one person is very much on time and the other one isn't? Is that Don't, okay? Yeah. One, We're not going to ask which one's on only time, one. Which one only it, one hand. Okay. That's All right. We'll we'll get more honest as the, as the weekend goes goes on. But it's been one of our main um, struggles. Yeah. It actually has yeah. been, and a lot Triggers. of it has to do with how we how we grew up. Like, and, and this is not okay. Understand, this is not putting anybody under the bus. This, these are just facts of life that I, I think sometimes helps us to just openly talk about it. It's like, so I'm very much an on-time person, and she's not. And a lot of, uh, well, she's come a long, long way. With our, with our ministry and schedules and all of that, like, like it, it, it's honestly amazing knowing, like, her, her family did not grow up. You know, time was just not as much important and as it was in our family, and so we obviously have, have those differences, but that was one of the things. We're, we're yeah, still... Yeah, so it's, it's fun to discuss different home cultures, uh, but I am a better person because I've lived with you for 31 years for sure. But so what happened? What, yeah. kind, what were you giving? You were, you were giving me the power to, if, to spoil your evening as we traveled because I wasn't ready. So for instance, now... I'm, I'm there already, and I'm waiting, and I'm thinking that she's doing things she wouldn't need to do. That's what I'm thinking. But that's not how she's thinking. Because we had a, a house full of youth coming and, and doing all that kind of stuff, and I'm just like, let, you know, let them take care of that. You know? But no, she's, she's the house. She's the, the housekeeper, and we have a 19-year-old daughter. Let her take care of that. 
Well, she had other things going. She, anyway, so I am processing all of this. Now, my, I was reacting. Can I be honest enough? I, I didn't really respond. I reacted. And one of my, one of my go-to mechanisms, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is when, when I get triggered or my button gets pushed, one of my, one of my negative, unhealed negative emotions are I just I shut down. I isolate. And I, that, that is a reaction, not a response. And so, so when, I, when I do that, when, when, I, when I react out of that, I have basically just allowed her to affect how I think and how I live right then. Instead of looking into my own yard and saying, Lord, why am I feeling this way? What's going on in my heart? It takes the blame game out of the marriage. And that's our, that's our goal this weekend, because it, is, it comes natural for us. If our spouse does something that triggers us, we immediately blame them for how we feel. We have just passed the power away instead of looking into our own yard and saying, okay, God, because God is for us. He's not against us, and he wants us to be drawn together, not against each other. And so let's look into our own yard. That's one of the ways we give the power away. Is there anything else you want to share on that? No, while you're going to that, was, it's, that's, God has really simplified it in my mind that when uh, all we are responsible for as Christians is to respond to everything that is allowed to come our way. It doesn't matter who it is, if yeah. it's weather, sickness, or people, all I'm responsible for is how I respond. Not for their actions, not, that just simplifies it so much, even in marriage, that, wow, that, that narrows it down for me. Uh, wow, Lord, just help me to know how to respond properly, and then he can work on the other people around us. Yeah, and he does a much better job at dealing with our spouse than we do. Because yeah. yeah. he's more kind and gentle and long-suffering and merciful than I am to you. So what you just told them is God is more kind and gentle than I am. I'm just yeah, kidding. And, I'm just kidding. and I am too. Yeah, we don't I know. Have this yeah, goal. we try to be like it's, it, That's exactly right. Because God, through the Holy Spirit, He's kind, He's gentle. But sometimes when we're in that reacting mode, we don't we, we don't talk like God does. We get upset or we get fly off the handle for a moment. Sure, you make it right. Um, but one, one, of, one of the things, I'll, I'll share this. Well, let, let me read this. Seeing our spouse as the primary fulfillment of our needs for significance and security not only sets us up for uh, disillusionment, it limits God's intended design for relationships. Now, let's get some. Yeah, go ahead. So on that one, I learned a lot about self-care. I'm not talking about selfishness or extravagant uh, lavish living, but I'm talking about, um, I looked, so we moved away from all my family, all my friends that I grew up with, all the church people that I knew, and all of a sudden I'm in a new community, and I looked to my husband too much for my social life, my affirmation, my fun, so many things that I put on him that when I was dating, I had other things like that, and all of a sudden as a housewife and all these little children, I was like, when he came home, I was like looking for all these things. And I realized that expectation kills relationship. That I need to go back to having a healthy friendship with girls, ladies. I need to try to figure out how during the day to have some connection with my sisters on the phone or something that I'm not fully relying on him. Ultimately, God is the one that meets our needs. And if we're single, we know we have to learn that. And we should maintain that when we're married to continue to go to him for our things and not to our spouse. That can switch sometimes when we Amen. think now we have a husband. Good word. Let's get the foundation of this whole thing. Uh, we're not just up here talking without a foundation. The foundation is the word of God. And Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He did not reply, love your spouse with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Instead, his reply affirms God as supreme and primary in where we center our devotion. So we, we keep this in mind. We, we're going to talk very practical, day-to-day -day illustrations, just life. But let's always remember that everything in life comes out, of, should come out of our relationship with the Almighty. That's, that's the foundation of all of this. And so love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And 
Mark 12, verse 30, different of the Gospels. That, that's the foundation of it all, because if this is not in place, then we will probably be reacting all the time instead of responding. So let's keep that in mind. Yeah, let me just say, I didn't finish yeah. that. The first self-care is actually it being in worship yeah. and not having you as my idol for my affirmation, but finding my identity in him and not in my sisters or my friends either. So I said that a little bit backwards. I meant to say first knowing who we are in the Lord and then those other social things. That's exactly right. God is the focus of our full surrender and love and devotion. Everything worthwhile in life, everything, everything worthwhile in life comes out of this connection, including a healthy marriage. While God is our primary focus, Jesus acknowledges that it is not the exclusion of others, not to the exclusion of others. We are created for a relationship with others, too. You know what he said? The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. And there is no commandment greater than these. Again, these are just foundational truth. Jesus instructs us to let the manner in which we love ourselves be the standard by which we aspire to love our neighbor, and our spouse should be at the top of the list who would qualify as neighbor. Let me, let me camp on that, what Jesus is teaching here, in the manner about loving ourselves. Um, that almost doesn't sound Christian because the Bible says, deny yourself. But he does say, instructions in the manner of which we love ourselves be the standard by which we aspire our love for our neighbor. So in Mark 12, 31, the second, this is a second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what, what, is, what is he saying there? What I believe is at the foundation of this is what we're talking about in, in finding healing for our negative emotions, the more whole we become. In him, body, soul, and spirit, First Thessalonians 5, the more whole we become in him, the more we are okay with who we are in him. And the more whole we become, I believe that so affects how we treat our spouse. That's what I believe he's saying by how we, are, how, how we feel about who we are in him. Not, I'm this great person, I'm this macho per not, not in that way, but in, in finding wholeness and healing in our life. And that sets us up, I believe, for a wonderful and healthy marriage. Now, a higher calling to be like Christ. Imitate God, therefore, in Ephesians 5, verse 1 and 2. In everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us offered himself as a sacrifice for us and a pleasing aroma to God. And then 1 John 2, verse 3 to 6. And I just want to share this, again, as a foundational, um, just the foundation of everything we're saying. Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. Now, while we are each other's responsible, while we are each responsible for ourselves, God did not intend for us to travel through life alone. When we get married, we partner with someone who is already on a personal journey of their own. I'll let you pick it up there. Yes, both of our personal journeys continue after we marry. Remaining aware and attending to each other of these different journeys is essential to a healthy marriage. Our personal journeys can so affect how we respond or react to each other. And that's the whole thing of the tools that we're going to be giving you this weekend is what to do about those. So we all have a past. Now, most of you have probably already been working on that and know, have tools, how to work through your past. You've recognized lies. Uh, but that's what we're going to be. We just picked up some fresh tools that have just really improved our communication to another level. And our, like he said, I found so much wholeness and healing from my past journey. We both had very different, even though we both grew up Amish, we both had very different 
cultures within that mini culture. Um, and I'm sure you guys have discussed many of your differences. And each parent, when, as our children are dating, you think about, oh, wow, what family, what kind of things are going to come up between the differences in the homes. And, but I'm so grateful that by the grace of God, there is no marriage that God cannot heal if we are willing to apply his grace to it. But those are fun subjects to talk about without making someone feel less than. None of your identity should be in what your parents weren't. None of us can help that. Mm -hmm. We were born into, I had to come, I had to get past what was not okay in my family. But mm -hmm. it's not our fault. It's okay. God placed us there, but we can overcome the lies that come with that in our identity. Mm -hmm. We had such different, um, like, when, when I go through things like this, like, I have to think long and hard. Like, I did not grow up with a lot of hurt and pain as a child. And I'm grateful for that. And my father, I don't remember if I shared this at the tent meetings or not, but my father was an Old Order Amish deacon in the church for 46 years prior to his passing in 2007. One of the kindest men I ever knew. And I'm so, so grateful for that. He was, we didn't see things eye to eye. We didn't always agree on things, but he was one of the kindest men I ever knew. So I didn't grow up having a lot of pain and hurt and dysfunction, even in school. And sure, I had disappointments. I felt, you know, a bit of rejection here and there and, and you know, things that, that I, I'm aware of. But there was not that major thing that even today I look back as a, a, a trauma or some dramatic thing. And so, so for, for her, you, you'll hear some of her story, and it wasn't that way for her. So now we get married in May of 1991. Sure, I had my issues. I had things I hadn't resolved yet and prayed through and, and all of that. But a lot of it I had brought on myself, not someone else. And, and any of these things that we're sharing, whether we share out of our home life or whatever, this is not to put your parents down or your schoolmates or whoever. This is, this is revelation that God brought for us to find healing so that we are now responsible to go to the next level with the revelation that God gives us, no matter how bad our past was or how good it was. And we are now to move on. But one of the things, well, let me, let me go to the next. Thinking about some of the common phrases we tend to use in our marriage um, discussions. And, and by, by the way, I'll share this at this time. One, one of the real things that we learned two years ago is, I mean, I would, I mean, we've been doing what we're doing in ministry for 24 years now. And so being in public all the time, like we would, I would, our kids, our children know from young up, we would always encourage them, we would never want to go public anywhere with unresolved conflict. Like because it, all it does is it hinders the anointing. And so, uh, hmm. we would sometimes, seconds or minutes before walking up front, Children asking each other for forgiveness. Now, granted, there were times when we had to, after a service, continue something, but at least to whatever you were able to <laughs> at that point, that never go public with unresolved comments. So we would always encourage resolve, but always encourage that. But the eye opener to us two years ago was for her and I in our and marriage. Let me just put in yeah. there the reason it was minutes before you went up. We also did this in the evening before we went to bed or any other time. Mm -hmm. But you all know that when you're under pressure to minister, often those last hour of getting ready and what's on your mind, people are tense. And we've learned a lot through the years how not to do that. But I think it was things that just happened that caused attitudes the last hour. That's why we were apologizing right before we went on stage. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like old stuff. But the interesting thing now that our children are grown they're still sometimes in the bus when you're bumping into each other and all that kind of stuff, you know, and, and the, the tensions Small rising. And everyone's uh, for the mirror one of the and children, they'll rise up now. Hey, guys, remember, remember, this is, this is warfare. Just reminding everybody, let's look to Jesus. You know, the children are now rising up and doing those kind of things. And what a blessing. But back to the resolve thing. We would always encourage resolve. But what her and I saw in our marriage is... 
even though we would always come to resolve. But we found that sometimes we hurt each other more getting to the resolve than what the initial circumstance cost by the way we processed getting to the resolve. We would rehash this thing. I'm trying to prove my point, and she's trying to prove her point. See, we have the blame game going on. And sometimes that blame thing hurt each other more than the initial circumstance. That was a wow moment for us. And we were like, yeah. Instead of looking into our own yard, we blame each other. And we're going to continue to encourage us how not to do that. And I'm sure many of you are long past that. You don't blame each other in your marriage. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We'll keep going and encouraging each other. But here, think about some, some of the common phrases we tend to use. And th this, is, this is when we are still in the blame game thing. See if any of these would identify. You know, the, well, you made me. Um, you made me think that when you said... Take the next one, hon. You made me. Or you made me believe this because all you ever talk about is, and I think all of us know that the ever and never and always and n never should never be used. Should never be used, yeah. <laughs> like, well, those you are, always. Those are no-nos. Well, you. But, honey, we didn't yeah. always sound that mean. We were very grown up about I it. I know. But we'll yeah. continue. You were. I wasn't. Um, yeah. We're going to refer to a paper that's in your folder in a little bit that helps you with this. Or you made me feel helpless because you never approve of anything I do. Or those, those kind of common phrases can occur uh, in marriages if we are in the blame game and we're trying to, to blame our spouse for how we feel. Now, anytime we say, look into your own yard, don't blame your spouse for how you feel, uh, we're also not saying... Just say what you want. They should never be hurt. Like, you, you understand. Like, like, it doesn't give the spouse the freedom to just say words of death because you got to deal with your own yard. You, you understand what I mean by that. Um, and so go ahead with this one. Can you hear it? In each of these examples, the speaker is attributing their thoughts, beliefs, feelings, or behavior to some cause created by their spouse. Notice how this perspective leaves us powerless to change because we believe our thoughts, beliefs, feelings, and behavior are controlled by our spouse. And then this usually leads to frustrating power struggles with us trying to change our spouse. As a result, the cycle of dependency, hurt, disappointment, and disillusionment quickly become all too familiar. Now, I'm going to put this next thing up there. And I want us to remember this. It is not your spouse's fault. We've been referring to it. But it is not your spouse's fault for how you feel. If we refer back to the me being late, I do want to work on not letting him down. I am responsible to try to honor. Mm -hmm. And we always try to look at what did we learn from this? What can I do better next time? I was asking him questions. Should I have called, changed the time? What, you know, what should I have done if I saw it wasn't? And I saw things that I could have done. Um, so it's not like I wasn't responsible for my part, but you had the power to respond by God's grace, right? That's right. Yeah, you were giving me the power over you. That's right. You liked that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to. I don't want to be able to mess up your day. <laughs> no. Uh, in your folder, there's one paper. Uh, one of so if you open your folders, the one side is for the husband, and one is for the wife, and there's no difference, except there's one extra sheet in here that's called Truth and Negative Thoughts, uh, the Bridgewell Coaching one, and that one has the alternative phrases that you can practice using instead of the ones that tend to irritate your spouse that you maybe use that sound more negative and more dominant and more accusing. So those are just some helpful ones if you're trying to change your habits uh, that you can refer to later. Yes. Tell you what... Um can, can we just all say this together just so that it, it rivets, it, it go that, that, bottom, that bottom one? Let's all say it together. It's not, not your spouse's, spouse's fault how you, how you feel. feel. Now, look at your spouse. J just look at each other and just tell them, it's not, not your fault for how I feel. Can you do that? Can you do that? It's not your fault for how I feel. 
You want it's me not to your know. fault for how I feel. Thank you. I forgot. I'm looking at them. I'm having fun looking at them. I forgot to look at my spouse. <laughs> it's not your fault how I feel. That is a huge relief. It's a big relief. Um, oh, that's freeing. In fact, uh, yeah, I'll just say real quick, when, when we were there, um, and they would have us practice by processing something that really just happened, and we'd love to have time with all of you to do this. We could bring two up here, and we could help you process something hard that you just went through. But they did, we did that, and they were like, the one, the second it morning. Was one, it was the second morning. Yeah, they were like, so does one of you have something new you want to talk about and work through? Were you triggered? I thought we had a great night. We went to Sight and Sound, and I thought we had a peaceful night. I was like, nope, I'm good. And he was like, uh, yeah. I was like, uh-oh, something happened. I didn't even notice I triggered him. So he was about, he was starting to tell what was going on and what he was feeling. And right away I went like, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I felt so bad. And they were like, uh-uh, nope, hold on. Ruth Ann, see, he has filters too. We want to figure out what his filters are and why he felt that way whenever I don't perfectly treat him the way he needs to be treated, why is he reacting? Because there is a way to respond to things that are not always perfect. But you, so you, you know what I, what I found? You, you should have seen the look on her face when, I don't remember if it was the man or the, the, or the lady, but, but when, when, he, when they told her, it is not your fault how he feels. I was like, what? Yeah. All my life, when he's not happy, I'm digging to try to figure out what I need to apologize for and what I need to do better. Yeah. I always take the blame. And I knew I had a victim mentality, yeah. and he wanted me to be free of that, but that sure didn't help. So, <laughs> so when they said, it's not your fault, I was just like, are you serious? Yeah. Well, now this is going to change my life. Yeah. And yeah. they were just like, you're not responsible and not everyone's happy in your house. Now you can have something to do with it, and you can look into it. But I was just like, they were like, you're not responsible for the happiness of all your children, your husband. And I thought for my parents, that's where I got it. I always, if they weren't happy, I was causing something, causing them trouble, whatever. Um, so I was just like, I mean, it changed my whole perspective. I think a lot of us moms probably, and some of the men might do that, take responsibility for whatever's not going well in your home. We are to be responsible, but there's a difference between taking the blame and feeling condemnation or just rising up and doing things better. But yeah, but uh, I was just uh, like, from now on, like if my children say, Mom, where's my blue shirt? I'll be like, you know, I used to be like, huh, I do laundry. I must have not put it in the right place. And I would run and try to figure it out. And I was like, well, I don't know. The laundry's all put away. It might be in the wrong closet. Go, f go look. You know, like I was just a whole different mentality that I'm not responsible for everyone's happiness if I'm just trying to do my job. Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Because if we, yeah, it's very cool. If, if you have that mindset, what, what it actually does is it, it drives you into a performance mode. Because in, in the past, before some of that revelation, we, I would often hear her say with a, a victim mentality, well, I just have to do better. Well, I just have to no. You find healing for that negative emotion or even the victim mentality mindset. And we'll, she's going to share more later about why she had that. Uh, but w what happens is when, when, you, when you're not healed from some of that, you go into a performance mode, I just have to do better, and you end up never measuring up. Because it's not about doing better, it's about finding healing in Christ for your negative emotions. And then, by the power of the Spirit, you become a different person. You become more whole, and out of that, then, you don't react like you used but to. But you have to learn to, to not receive what they're used to projecting on you. Yeah, and that's right. a process to talk. That's another whole yeah. story. You know, in, you don't want to say, if he's silent because I was late, I don't want to say, I don't receive that. You yeah. know, I can be late if I want to be. You don't want to be rude. Yeah. But inside, you're thinking, I don't receive the condemnation. I tried my best, Lord. You can, mm -hmm. I can apologize, but I don't need to feel all condemned. There's okay. a difference between apology and a condemnation. That's yeah. exactly right. All right. Well, it's not your spouse's fault how you feel. Let's reflect on our past for just a bit. Are there past experiences, perhaps abuse, neglect, inconsistency, or lack of modeling that hold a vice grip on us, keep us relationally 
stuck in some way? Maybe take a moment and reflect of something that happened or did not happen that we wanted to. How did it make us feel back then? Are there things that happen today in our relationships that remind us of how I felt back then? And this is um, just a reality, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, this is the way the human brain works, that even, a, even as a parent, this would come into parenting, which is tomorrow morning, but if your child reacts at 10 or 12 years old to something that was fairly minor that their sibling did to them or you said to them, if they cannot respond, it is a good chance that you're hitting on something that was done to them before that felt similar that they have not yet resolved. And I love, it's fun to watch for that in your spouse and in other people and to say, even my friends, I'll say, whoa, 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 what was that? How did that make you feel? Why, you know, if you sense that they're reacting, it's a way to care for their heart to say, how did that just make you feel? Ashamed or afraid or whatever, and then you can start asking. It usually goes back and you can say, okay, that happened here, and then it happened here. And if you go far enough to where it first happened that you receive that lie of whatever you feel, whether you feel condemned or whatever, we'll talk about how you find healing, how we've found healing from a lot of those lies. And some of you already know that, but that's what this is all about, is mm -hmm. helping other people find healing. And It's interesting. Um, in life, I had somebody in my office not long ago, and they were sharing their heart about a relationship. It was not a it was not a marital thing, but just to make an illustration about um, things that have happened in our past that affect whether we react or respond. And she's it was a lady, and she's sharing with me about this individual that she had a really really hard time getting along with. It was a coworker, and I listened to her heart. And after she was done, I asked her, how did it make you feel when your co-worker does this? And she said how it made her feel. Then I asked her the second question. Did you ever feel that before you worked at this place with anybody else? And she said, oh, yeah. I said, okay. So it's really not the individual you're dealing with. It's something going on in your heart. So let's ask Jesus, because she felt, she felt the same emotion from another situation as this situation. But she's blaming this situation or this individual. See, when you're in the blame game, that's what you do. And you, you get nowhere. And then I was explaining some of these principles to her, and it is like, the light bulb went on, and I, we began to pray and ask Jesus to reveal what is going on in her heart and why she feels this. And it was amazing. In fact, out of that, she wrote a, I don't know, a two-page letter front and back about what God did in her life through that five-minute thing of understanding mm -hmm. to not blame that person. Now, you bring that into a marriage? Wow. Go ahead. Yeah, she's one that, if you're one that wants to journal... As she asks herself questions and she starts writing, God gives her answers to her own questions. It's amazing mm -hmm. and reveal things to her. Probably what my example, one of my huge filters that's gone that was with me many years. When Before we got saved, we renounced all the ways that we thought we had opened doors to the enemy. And we, you know, cleansed it with the blood of Jesus. It was Jesus, after we, we got clean. saved, but things had happened before we got saved. I'm sorry, what yeah. did I say? Before we got married, after yeah. we got saved, before we got yeah. married... We had a whole year of dating as Christians, and we cleaned all that up. But there was things that were renounced, but there wasn't revelation and healing yet. That's what's been coming. Mm -hmm. um, and this one was, so if there's an area of conflict, if there's an area that you and your spouse tend to always get a, ri it gets a rise out of each other. So one of ours was, if I would do like a Christmas letter or do something on the computer that I would then send email to him for him to print out at the office, um, and I am a self-taught computer person, and him and I are self-taught kind of, and we go into programs differently, and we use different, um, yeah, different fonts, different ways of, of doing our projects, and so often I felt like he would come back and just make me feel so dumb 
he'd say, I had to totally redo it because you had a different program, whatever. He, I would just always end up feeling really dumb. And I thought he was just rude and unkind in how he communicated to me. He wasn't very sensitive. That's how I thought for many years that he's just, that's his personality. He just tends to, you know, walk over me and, and I don't think, or, or tell me things. And he, he doesn't realize how it makes me feel. So I thought it was his problem. And I tried to forgive and just like accept who he is and celebrate who he is and just let it be and just let it roll off because I wanted to be teachable. But we had another one, one morning there, I remember in the dining room where we stood. And I was just like, why is this a thing? Here we go again. It's just about printing something out. And here we have conflict again. And I was thinking all of a sudden, and we had to just kind of, you know how you sometimes put a Band-Aid on it and make peace? Because he has to go to work, and you know it's going to be continued conversation sometime to get to the root of it. That's what we did. And I sat in the living room there on the chair, and I was just like, okay, so he has however many secretaries and other people under him working at the office with computer stuff all the time. If they don't have a problem with him, maybe it's me. Maybe just me. Maybe <laughs> I'm the one that's a problem. And so I was just like, Lord... I want to have a teachable spirit. Why is this an area of conflict? And it, it wasn't that morning that God revealed it to me. We had, um, to make a long story short, we had times of prayer and seeking God and crying out to God, Lord, you know what's at the root of this. What is at the root of this? Why do I feel so stupid? Dumb is the word that came to me. Just doom. Like, just don't have it like the others in that area. I knew I was good at other things, but I just always felt kind of dumb when he corrected me. Um, and it wasn't just that area, but different areas if you would correct me. And, and so one time when we were on our knees and we were praying about it, and God gave you amazing mercy. So there's been several times in our life that the Holy Spirit just gave him Jesus' compassion for me in a way that's not Dave, that's beyond a human, mm -hmm. that he cared for my heart. Even sometimes when he was the one that was hurting me, he had compassion from Jesus to minister to me. And letting our husbands be our high priest is a big trust factor, especially, yeah, it's, it takes vulnerability. But, um, and he was ministering to me, and all of a sudden, the memory came. A memory that I didn't know I had, and I had never remembered before. And it was me as a little girl on top of a wooden table out in my dad's shop. My dad did make duck work. He was a heating and air conditioning guy, and sometimes he would have, I had three sisters, he would have us girls come out and hold his ductwork while he either welded or um, riveted it together. And we didn't have gloves on, our little soft hands would often almost be cut, so we had to be careful how we held it. And I just remember, I was on one end, we all had a corner, we were holding it for Dad. And we didn't do a lot with Dad. When we did, we really wanted to please him. And so somehow my end slipped as he was trying to fasten it, and his face, like in the memory, I remember his face looking frustrated and angry. And as a little girl, you know, as parents, we can look frustrated. We don't realize how we look to our children. And to me, I took it as I caused that. He's disappointed in me. And he said in Dutch, not like that. Like in other words, net so. And he looked mad. To me, he looked mad. I understand now. We do that, those kind of things as parents. What I'm amazed at is God showed me that I felt like I was not like my sisters and I could just couldn't do it right and I felt really dumb. Just the way he looked at me made me feel dumb and talked to me. And I don't blame my dad at all for that. It's like when the Holy Spirit shows you, there's no blame or condemnation to the person that came through right. because they often are so unaware. But we receive it in a way that just a fallen world, it's, it's what happens, it's, life happens. Anyhow, when I realized that I was like, oh my word, that makes sense that most all of my life, if I failed someone, I would feel so dumb. Like, why can't I get it together? And once I was aware of that, when that feeling came, I was like, no, it's fine. I didn't say I was good at everything. I don't have to prove anything. I'm good at some things, not good at this, whatever. I have nothing to prove to anyone. It just like rolled off of me that I can actually be wrong and less than, and it's fine. But it was that lie that I'm dumb, I'm less than, and you want to defend yourself. You want to mm -hmm. rise up and protect yourself. And now it doesn't feel hurtful anymore. It's just amazing. And that's a perfect example of bringing this before the Lord and saying, Lord, why do I feel that way? 
She's looking into her own yard instead of, now that doesn't justify my actions to her, doesn't justify that at all. I need to look at, God, why am I reacting to that? But for her, it was in the moment of asking Jesus, why did I feel that? That revelation came, and when that revelation came, that memory came, you bring that to Jesus and let him heal that now. And we can talk about computer now, stuff. You can and do the same thing, and I just, you can talk to me the same way, and I'm just more like, you're at peace because you don't have that live bug in you. I yeah, don't you don't have the filter. I can, I can just be like, it rolls off of me yeah. like a rubber dart or something. Yeah, what an incredible, incredible blessing. Um, I know we need to keep moving here. Let's reflect on our past. In what specific ways might our past hurt still limit us in our life and our marriage today? Is it difficult to take, our, to take in our spouse's genuine gestures of love? Well, that's another thing. They say that if, if your spouse, ha if I have those lies, he could try to affirm and love me, but I was like a bag of holes. Because I d couldn't believe it. I thought he was just trying to be kind, and I couldn't receive the affirmation because of the lie that blocked the reception of mm -hmm. the love. Yeah. How might we be hiding our true feelings and desires from our spouse, even from ourself? Again, simply stated, I am responsible for my own physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being. Scripture invites us, let's keep moving. Scripture invites us to be personally responsible for our reactions, no matter what the other person is doing. Two passages describing events in Jesus' life illustrate his exercise of his personal power to not be controlled by others when others are behaving in ways which provoke anger and retaliation. Luke chapter 6, 27, 29. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And if someone slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other one. Turn them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. And when a crowd attempted to harm him, Jesus opposed their intentions and took care of of himself. Luke chapter 4. When they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill of which the town was built. They intended to push him over the cliff, but he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. In both examples, we see Christ modeling the idea of taking care of his own yard, regardless of the unruly behavior of those around him. So here's some unhelpful questions to avoid. What really happened if you're in a conflict? You're in a conflict like unhelpful questions to what? Well, what really happened or who is right and who is wrong? Or there it is again. Whose fault is it? And I put that in there again. It is not your spouse's fault. That was another interesting scenario that I didn't realize that God revealed um, that in our home, and it, it could have been that my grandparents, one of the grandparents in our home, when we would discuss a circumstance, we would try to figure out whose fault it is. Mm -hmm. One of the first things. That is so from the pit. I mean, the kingdom of God is not about figuring out whose fault it is, ever. I was just like, I didn't realize I had such a mindset of, well, either I have to take it or he has to take it. Who's going to take it this time? Instead of saying, okay, I acknowledge my part, and it's up to him about acknowledging his part, but I don't have to go into condemnation that it's just my fault. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between when the Holy Spirit convicts us, he always gives us what we can do about it, okay? It's like he'll give us a specific thing to repent of, not just random, a whole bunch of confusing things that feel condemning. We had a daughter that was extra sensitive, and she has a book out here about processing that but and many other things. Mm -hmm. But Dave walked her through a lot of things where she would be like, I just feel so bad about what all I said tonight at the party or whatever. And we'd have to try to f help her say, is there something specific? Because often God just shows us our motive. Mm -hmm. He gets to the motive of what we did. 
that she didn't have to apologize for everything she said, but if she had pride or selfishness, she could just repent of that and then see if she even has to make anything right with her friends. But that's a process with children and with ourselves is, is it the Holy Spirit? Because he doesn't bring condemnation. He brings a clear way to get out of it and repent. And that's so relieving. Um, I don't know if we ever shared this before in this session, but when, what, when she was describing about in her home, when something happened, it didn't matter if it was in the home, outside the home, or whatever. Whose fault is it? Um, take that, if, if, if that is the way we live and think all our life up through, we've seen this in older people when, 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 they're, when they're starting to, maybe their mind isn't as sharp anymore, or they're, the, the things that was so common all the way up through at an older age become more and more out front again. Just like what she described in, in whose fault is it, or the negative way of processing life. That comes out at an old age, and it makes it very, very difficult for those children then to try to care for their parents. But if those parents would find healing for this stuff, look what it would save the children. And so. I'll be honest, a lot of us wait till our children are kind of grown because I had more time to think then. Sometimes you just let things go because you're busy and you're just surviving and you're, you're staying happy as a couple because of your children. But once, the, once your mind isn't as full with the busyness, that's when often some of us get counseling and get help. But it, we are just amazed at how much we love it being in our 50s because we've worked through so much of it. We're just so safe with each other. We just love life together. I'm like, there is so much freedom. It's worth taking care of our stuff and just enjoying our older age and being at peace with ourselves so that when we get older and we don't have as much self-worth because we're not, not everyone's looking to us for something, we're okay with just who we be. That's right. Who we be. Is that proper we English? Can't do. We can at least be it's close somebody. enough. Close enough. We may not pose the question directly like we just learned, but rather imply them within statements like, no, that's not the way it was. What you really said or did was or that's not the way I remember it. What happened first was, see, there we're in the rehashing stage. And that's what we were referring to earlier about. Sometimes on the way to, to the resolve, we hurt each other more on the way there than what the initial circumstance caused because of some of these things. We would rehash this thing and add things to it, or at least I would, and, and add things to it because I wanted to prove my point. Guys, we but don't we have, have to prove happen. anything. But you are the, to be heard. We have yeah. good solutions for that. That's what we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. talk about it now? Um, what is next? Are we done with? If you would only do this rather than that, everything would be okay. That probably never happened in your home or in your marriage. Or I would have done that if you hadn't done or said. Yeah. Go ahead. Are we done with the negative? Mm -hmm. Let's finish with the negative, then we'll bring the positive. Such statements, such statements are laced with judgment and blame. Notice how they draw attention to each other's reactions and give all the power to our spouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before we go into that, if you open your um, folders and you see the little heart talk and work talk on the left, the little card, just right on the bottom. You don't have to get it out. Just look at it. Do most of you have it? Okay, so... Um, are we going to talk more about this tomorrow night? I think, but we're going to at least introduce it. So these are ways what to do instead of to avoid the reactive cycle. Um, so let's look at the left side, the heart talk. Let's say that you just saw that I was triggered. Mm -hmm. um, and let's say you have to decide who's the speaker and who's the listener. It's very basic, but this works for children in arguments and tattling and, and parents that are arguing. <laughs> it works for anybody, businessmen. Mm -hmm. But one person needs to, whoever was triggered, the other person should be sensitive and ask the question, 
wait, what just happened? How did that make you feel? Mm -hmm. um, so if I ask you, then I am the listener and you are now the speaker, mm -hmm. okay? The speaker, it says, that uses soft, slow, short. He, he is to speak soft, slow, and short with eye contact, and that's a huge one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we're driving and we're having conflict, we will, if it's intense enough, we will say, let's wait till we can be home, especially if it's dark, that we can look at each other because um, many times he has said things and he has no idea. I sit over there in the dark how that hurt my heart because he's not looking into my face. He doesn't know what it's doing to me and he's just telling me what he thinks mm -hmm. and vice versa. If I'm not looking at your face, I don't see what I'm doing to your heart mm -hmm. as I'm talking to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we've both hurt each other in that way. So the listener is supposed to not interrupt and not defend themselves, but then summarize in the end. So let's give a short little example. And then the one, two, and three is what we will do before I become the speaker and you become the listener, before it switches. Okay. So we're going to get in more detail tomorrow night, but these are just ways that we can avoid. Do we wait to give the big key tomorrow night, or do more? So the one on the the right we'll is we'll keep work you in talk. suspense. Um, the one on the right is work talk, which is if we're trying to make a big decision about moving or buying a business or a car, they have a healthy process how to do that as a husband and wife until both of you feel good about it, and sometimes it takes days or weeks, but you do the work of elimination and work creatively to see if someone is willing to compromise to come together, that you both feel good about this big decision you're about to make, that it's not one is a loser, one is a winner. Mm -hmm. It should never be, you should both be winners when you decide on something. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into more of that uh, tomorrow night on the the healing process and the creating space when we have these negative emotions. And this is just a very brief introduction as to what that could look like. But we want to we want to wrap this up tonight by uh, what we call the reactive cycle. You've probably heard different terms used, the crazy cycle or the we, we actually call them roundabouts down in our little town in North Carolina where our office is. Uh, we have what's called roundabouts. You probably, I don't know, do you have those in New York? It's, it's actually a third world country concept. That's where I first learned back in the early 90s in Africa. You come to these roundabouts. What is this? Uh, you know, roundabouts, you ever get up to one and somebody doesn't know how they work? And they stop in the middle of the roundabout, which is a no-no. But a roundabout, you know, if you would come into a roundabout and you would just stay in it, you, you wouldn't get anywhere. And that's a little bit with what happens with unhealed negative emotions. And we want to just, we'll, we'll call it the reactive cycle. So you have her wants, you have his wants. Now, there's, 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 there's nothing wrong with these desires. We all want to be heard. We all want to be loved. We all want to be accepted. There's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, we're going to we're going to show you what her and I, when we filled out these papers, which you have, and we're going to ask you to do something when you get home tonight. You don't have to do it now, but you have something in your folder that's called the Reactive Cycle Worksheet. And so the first pages all the way up until... Page 160 is the feelings. After the feelings is the reactions. And then after the reactions, then you get to the wants. And so we're going to ask you to fill these out. And the first section is all about the negative emotions that you feel. And there's, goodness, there's a whole bunch of them. And don't feel bad. If you check mark all of them or 10 of them, but also don't feel bad if you only check mark three or four. But go ahead. Did you want to expound yeah. on it? So I want to say this, that this is not supposed to be scary. Dave usually doesn't enjoy homework when we go to marriage conference, and I love it. Yeah. So you might be say one, that again. one or the other. But if you grew up in a home, we all have different home cultures. If you grew up in a home 
where you were never asked how you felt and you were not heard and you never put words to any of your emotions that you felt. You were just supposed to be strong and um, always quiet and whatever and put up with whatever and obey. If that was your home culture, don't feel less than. This is God welcoming you that he gave you emotions for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Emotions are a good thing. Our marriages would be so dead without it. Our lives would be so boring. So it's, it may be harder for some of you because you don't even know what you feel. You just know you didn't like what was going on. Something didn't feel good inside you. But it may take several years for you to learn to put words to the negative things that you feel. And your spouse can be a huge part of drawing that out of you. If something happens and you see they don't feel good, you're saying, wait, how did that make you feel, that scenario? And what did that remind you of? Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not used to it, don't be afraid to just be like, I'm not sure, I think this, whatever. And they also say, when there is lies, there is very specific words that you think of. Just like I had the dumb instead of stupid. I didn't feel stupid, I felt dumb. Mm -hmm. So if let's say it says deceived and you feel like someone tricked you or was not truthful or you have other words for deceived that more feels like what you feel, just write it underneath and you can use your own words that hit your heart because then we will have a way to number them and see which ones are you feeling the most. And we can look at that for healing. So this is a way to care for your heart. This is not something you're going to hand in to us. This is for you and your spouse to get to know each other and how you can better care for each other's heart. It's really special. It's actually really good. And you fill it out for yourself, not for your spouse. Yeah, you'll each in other have words, one yeah. About yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you each have one. So if you if there's times when you feel abandoned, that, I mean, that's the first one on the list there, abandoned. So a description of that is my spouse will ultimately leave me and I will be alone or I will feel alone. Like if 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 there's so out of all of these, they taught us that probably if, if you check mark 20 of them, don't feel bad. I don't remember how many I check marked, but narrow it down. You can probably narrow it down to three to five that keep occurring more than any of the others. See, do they ask him to star him in Yes, there? you star yeah, the it'll, top it'll, five. It'll, it'll walk it's through. all instructed in how to process it. And I, I don't enjoy this kind of stuff, but I will tell you this, guys, if you don't enjoy it, God help me to do it because it helped me tremendously to understand my own heart. And why I feel the way I do when these kind of things happen. Uh, yeah. Push through it. You can do it by the grace of God and trust his spirit to help because it is, it is, it is very, very beneficial. And that means you matter. It care, it, it, it's worth looking at. You, it matters what you feel as well as your spouse's. Now, if you're not married and you want one of these, I think we have some extra. This is not just for married people. This is for you to understand yourself, whether you're single or married. So if somebody wants these mm -hmm. um, and doesn't have a folder, please ask us. I think that Ashley or we should be able to get you some because everybody matters whether they have a spouse or not. Yeah. Yep. So we're, we're going to conclude with this diagram here and to just, again, emphasize what happens when we have unhealed negative emotions. So we're, we're going to start with her wants and his wants. So... Th this is what, and this is, that's the last section on your paper there. Yeah, so it's really fun. It's actually asking you, what do you want in your marriage? What do you want to feel? What yeah, do you wh what do you want to feel? It's so it's really fun to put your goals down because that's not wrong. That's good. Those are things God wants for a marriage. So for Ruth Ann, this is where she came out. She wanted acceptance. She wanted companionship. She wanted connection. She wanted partnership. She wanted to be understood. That was what the top five that she desired. Here were my and top may five. May I just say something? Yeah. What's really sad when I look at that is those are the exact things I wanted as a little girl from my dad. Yeah. Like exactly. these just transfer up to grown-up marriage, but it's the same things you want usually when you're young too. Now yours? And his wants. I learned that Dave wants acceptance, companionship. A few similar ones. Respect. Hope, and the reason that hope is in there is one of his main feelings when I ask him, how does that make you feel? If I continue to let him down stuff, and it was hopeless. 
Hopeless is a horrible feeling to have. It just felt so hopeless that we'll never get it right. Mm-hmm. We'll always can deal with this. So hope is the opposite of hopelessness. Mm-hmm. And assistance. And I was like, I want to be those things to him. Come on, get it right. That is who I want to be to him. So now we're going to conclude with his buttons, his reactions, her buttons, and her reactions. Yeah, like so our here's coping mechanism. What do we do when we don't feel good? Here's what happens. Here were, here were my top five on this paper when I filled it out. My buttons. In other words, these, these were the triggers when she would do something. Oh, no, I'm it, sorry. I was wrong. Buttons are not reactions, not coping. We'll get to the it's reactions. It's the emotion you're feeling. That's I'm right. Sorry. No, you're good. So my, 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 my buttons are I felt judged. I felt controlled. I felt disappointed. I felt uncared for, felt neglected. Why does that make me look good? No, you're you're all right. You're <laughs> I'm all right. A good spouse. But ah. it's now I can blame her for making me feel that way, or I can look into my own yard. But if I have these unhealed emotions, look at my reactions. This is how I react to it. I start criticizing her. I become defensive. Fact find. Hmm. It almost sounds like a government term. But fact find. I go into a fix it mode. I want to fix her so she doesn't do that anymore. These are my reactions to my push buttons. Or I isolate, shut down. Those are my reactions to my pushed buttons. And it's so interesting because I would rather he do all the others except for the last one. Yeah. That one hurts me the most when I feel like he's shutting me out. It like I go into panic. It's like mm-hmm. I would rather he talk to me, criticize me, all that, but then to just be quiet and shut me out is really hard for me. So our our goal is to get our buttons healed. <laughs> is that a way to say it? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. So now her buttons, she dealt a lot with feeling alone, feeling controlled by me because my personality, I could walk all over her. No excuse. You know, our personality should never give us an excuse to hurt somebody. Personality studies are great. Mm -hmm. They're great to identify how people operate, but we should never use our personalities for leverage to do what I want to do. To see your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, Another button, invalidated, which what she felt. Misunderstood or unknown. Just don't feel like people care or no man her reactions to those buttons were fact find <laughs> clinginess don't you love when someone calls you clingy woman <laughs> uh, fix it mode innocent victim rationalize th- those were her reactions now now, now look, look at what comes next so this is what happens when we have these unhealed emotions we're in the roundabout see what happens my buttons get pushed. I react. Push her buttons. Her buttons get pushed. She reacts. Goes right back to my buttons. And there we are going in a circle, and we are not getting anywhere. In fact, we completely miss her wants and my wants in this cycle. That's where I wonder if not too many marriages are at. I have no idea here tonight but we don't want to stay here we don't want to stay here i know we could just turn some music on for a little bit can we do that back there but this is where we're gonna head tomorrow night to get out of the reactive cycle and get into the care cycle well we're going to focus how to include get out of the roundabout and get to her wants get to his wants and this is how we get there by creating a safe place where we feel completely safe with each other to process these negative emotions we come into the presence of the Lord Holy Spirit Why are these even buttons? Why am I reacting?
let Jesus do his thing. Creating a safe place, safety first, openness, and intimacy. This safe place is a great place. It's a great place to come to. and we're thinking of ourselves. So that's a good way to just stop a conversation and say, I don't feel safe right now, but we want to have this conversation. I want to continue this conversation. But it helps you to put it on hold and both of you to process it until you're more in a healthy place. Yeah. So if you would, take the time to fill those out. What we put into it is what we get out of it. May God help us to do that. Father, We are so grateful for these couples here tonight. And we pray somehow that things that were shared or were said tonight or that, Lord, you would help us to understand even in greater ways what is my responsibility and what is not. And why do I react instead of responding? And then, Lord, would you help us to identify those negative emotions, unhealed emotions, things that trigger us? And then, Lord, we thank you that as we identify those, then how to, that you actually, yeah, you have created a safe place for us to process these things. And thank you tonight that we have the assurance from your word that you are for us and not against us. And our spouse is not our enemy. Thank you. Thank you. And I pray that in all the different marriages represented that, Lord, would you, through the Holy Spirit, just help each one of us to apply it according to where we're walking. One's not more important than the other. So we thank you and we love you. 
And we honor you for this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, There's one more thing as I was praying. Can we stand together? And if you could, just look at your spouse, face each other like this. If you're able to, and tell your spouse again, it's not your fault how I feel. Are we good? God bless you. Uh, tomorrow morning, you don't have to bring these folders. It'll be a, a different, not from this material, but more on uh, child training, Lord willing, unless the Lord changes that. Um, and I know many of you could share on that, um, but we're looking forward to that. But do, if you're coming back tomorrow night, we encourage you to bring those folders along and even those papers, because we may be referring to them, although we're not going to look at your papers. That's not a grading thing. It's for our own benefit. Amen. Pastor George, is there anything you want to say in conclusion? We're, we're done. Okay, yes. Um, maybe tomorrow sometime we'll share a trailer. We do have our Gospel Express table back there. All our music is on there. Uh, and um, our latest recording from our family, well, our latest recording, we're actually just finishing a brand new one that is unfortunately not available tonight, but it will be, Lord willing, in another month or so. Music is back there. Uh, there are two books. In fact, uh, if you remember last summer, in the tent meetings, we were talking about Ruth Ann just finishing a book, and then we were here in March, was it? Had a sign-up sheet for it. If you didn't get that, Highly recommend it. It is called Glad You Ask. There is over 500 questions in there to take your children on dates, uh, or you can even take your spouse on dates. Uh, but it is anything from uh, preschool all the way up through a college and cr um, career. And it is full of questions. And uh, in fact, this book came out of a lot of what she would have wanted growing up. Now that she's been able to give it to our children, thank God, and experiences that she had in raising and helping raise our children. And then our oldest daughter, who's married, uh, she wrote this book a few years ago, and this is more on father-daughter relationships, and that is available uh, back there as well. All right. Anything else? God bless you. What time is the service tomorrow morning? 10 a.m. All right. God bless you. Go in peace. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. And tomorrow night is 6.30 again, right? All right. God bless you.